اوكي اكون سمو فيها مليح وي اوكي جريتس All right, so Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So welcome back to our second edition of the uh, WAST 24, or we call it Webinars on Advanced Science and Technology for 2004, uh, 2024, actually. We will be giving uh, each Saturday uh, from 5 to 6 p.m. a conference related to the science and technology for graduate students, researchers, and postdoc in Algeria. This year, we'll be giving uh, 11 webinars on different topics uh, like biology, mathematics, science, social sciences, etc. And we will go from today, February 3rd, uh, the first webinar, to June 1st, 2024, the last one. So please be advised that all webinars will be live streamed and available uh, in our YouTube channel, that is Aska uh, DZ. And so without uh, taking too much time, I'm honored today to present our uh, first uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Bujilal Mohammed. So Dr. Bujilal Mohammed is the director of the drug discovery and the chairman of the core facility at KAI KAI MRC uh, Riyadh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Dr. Bujilal is the inventor of a number of therapies which some of them are actually marketed uh, medicines. He is a member of a number of international research organizations, like, for example, he's a founding member of the Algerian Competences mm. Association, uh, ACA. He is a founding member of the Science Edit for the Developing World. He is also a member of our group, the Algerian Science and Technology, uh, Algerian uh, Science ASCA competences abroad, and he is also a member of the Algerian Science and Technology Council in Algeria, who is actually uh, under the umbrella of the president of the presidency of Algeria. So, Dr. Boujoulel, you can you can start your talk. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Faiz, and it's really a great pleasure to be with you today and present uh, uh, my first uh, webinar regarding the uh, innovative drug discovery. So what I would do actually, I will go only into the basic and I'm not going into very deep uh, what it takes, but I will give you an overview of what are the things that are now considered as innovative drug discovery um, uh, path. And this is actually, it could be the path for the uh, young scientists to follow it up and maybe invest more time because in these topics, there is a future. There is future both as, um, uh, as a career and also there is a future that you can bring something to the patient, which is our ultimate goal when we are doing biochemical, uh, biomedical uh, science. And in, in KMARC, uh, which is King Abdullah International Medical Research Centers, we are actually investing a lot in drug discovery and it's one of our pillar of um, uh, of the uh, uh, our pillar of research. So what I will do, I will share uh, my screen with you. Uh, uh, do you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. So uh, what I will do actually is um, so when we talk uh, uh, currently, when we talk about what means the innovative drug discovery. Actually, a few topics came to your mind, which is I encourage all the young scientists and researchers to look at them. And the first one is the artificial intelligence in drug discovery. The second is the mRNA-based therapy vaccines and the vaccines that are based on the mRNA-based. Based. We have also the CAR T-cells and TCR-based therapy, where actually we can build a T-cell that actually can attack um, uh, uh, tumors in the um, uh, in the body, and this is innovative. We have also a lot of antibody-based therapy that are very innovative, and it will have a lot of futures. And in the small molecules, there is a trend now which is called the protag uh, for the small molecules, where it actually is technology that uh, is uh, to target protein that they are to degrade them in the cells and get rid of them. Uh, because some of the proteins are, it can't be inhibited uh, by small molecules, but actually we can target them into degradations and get rid of them, uh, especially also the misfolded proteins that are in many rare diseases. 
So in today's presentations, I will try to first, the first topic, which is the artificial intelligence drug discovery. If we have time, I will also highlight and present for the mRNA-based therapy and vaccines. But if we don't have time today to present the mRNA-based uh, therapy and, uh, and vaccines, I will present them in the another occasions. In addition, I will present in other occasions uh, the protag and also the antibody and the CAR T cells. So uh, when actually when we are talking and I will give you a very basic when we are talking about drug discovery, uh, we are talking about something that has been it has been there for a long time. For example, you know in traditional medicines we, that is a thousand years old, it is a drug discovery. Hippocrates, for example, is known as which called the aspirin chemical forefathers because in somehow the aspirin has been discovered a long time, it has been used a long time, but only recently we have named it. Also, actually, you know, for the inoculations, it is about 2000 years old. And also, it has also drawn back for, because of this, it has been drawn back for toxicity and efficacy. Now, when we go into the modern life and modern history, we can start with Ibn Sina, that actually he, in the, uh, he, he was born in 1980, where actually he, uh, he published the book of healing and also the canon of medicine. That is actually, it's made the encyclopedia of medicines, where actually he showed that the drug and how the drug is working in the body and the philosophy out of that. Then actually when we have uh, the uh, uh, vaccines in the uh, uh, Geneva uh, in uh, 1878, 70, uh, 76, found the first vaccine for the Cobox prevent smallpox. And then you have Pasteur that made actually a vaccine against anthrax and rabies. And then in the uh, 1930s, uh, sulfo uh, sulfonamides were developed for anti as antibacterials and then penicillin as the miracle drugs. And then came the modern, which called the modern chemistry, where the drug discovery has started in making the uh, new uh, medicine. Now, when we are talking about drug discovery, what does it mean? Is the process of finding new medication based on the knowledge of the biological target. What we mean by the biological target, we mean that in every cells, there is a proteins and there are enzymes, there are transcription factors, there are channel, ion channels, there are different proteins. And this actually, it's, it's, it, it formed the target of, um, uh, of our molecules to modulate its activity, either by inhibiting, inhibiting its activity or increasing its activity. And that's what we call the biological target. Now, uh, what is known, uh, we use the, the, the uh, uh, commonly organic small molecules that activate or inhibit this function of the proteins. And also it involved the design of molecules that completely, that complementary in shape and charge for biomolecular biomole bi target. So for example, you know, in the me uh, natural medicines, we do have molecules that actually activate or inhibit these targets, but in that structure it's too big. It's uh, sometimes it's very difficult uh, to synthesize them in, in, in the lab. And what we tend to do in the medicinal chemistry, we tend to do actually look at the part of the molecules that actually is active, and then we synthesize it and we do the modification to increase its affinity. And also it has less toxicity and so forth. And then we develop it further to be a drug. So that is what, the small molecules based uh, drug discovery in, in, in general. Now, when we look at the scheme on how this is being done in the lab and how it is being created in the lab, now the process of uh, discovering a drug and then taking it to different clinical trials until it reaches the market, it's a long process and also is very costly. So uh, it can take from 12 to 15 years 
from the concept that actually came to your mind and actually you test it in the, in the lab and then you go and develop a drug and develop molecules to inhibit it. It's a long time, it's a long process. And this long process, it has phases. Uh, it has what's called a target validations. Uh, what mean target validation? This is the most important. It's very early, but it's the most important. The most important is that, for example, when we take a cancer cells or we take inflammatory cells or we take uh, a diabetes or we take infections or we take... So we look for the protein that actually is causing this disease. Now, many of these diseases are not caused by a single target. It can be caused by multiple targets. But usually there is one protein that is central in all of them. And we look to that proteins and we either it's an enzyme or ion channels or memory receptors or maybe a DNA binding uh, like transcription factors. And we look at that. And we do a lot of assay to validate that actually if we inhibit this or if we take it out from the cells, what will happen to the cells? For example, cancer cells. Is the cancer cells going to be, for example, uh, 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 killed? Or maybe it's, it, it will be developed differentiation. So it will limit the pro propagation of the cells. So we have to do all this work that in the lab, tedious, hard work, but we have to make sure that actually this proteins is important. For example, you know, uh, many kinases it's, are involved in inflammations. And if we inhibit them, we can say, for example, the cytokines in the inflammatory cells uh, are reduced. Or, and also they are involved in, 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 in a cancer. So when we inhibit them, we can kill the cancer cells. Now, we are lucky sometimes that actually the disease is associated, associated by mutated proteins. So, for example, if we see a protein has been mutated, for example, few of the kinases are mutated in cancer. So when we look at them and say, oh, this kinase is, over, is highly active in the cells because it's mutated, then it's easy. So we say, okay, when we inhibit this kinase, the, we kill the cells. That's happened, but it's not always like that. So this process is called target validations. And then it takes like two, three, four years. And then we go to the lead di discovery where we, we find the small molecules to inhibit and then lead optimizations. We have to optimize this, this chemical and these inhibitors or activators to give us a higher affinity and less toxicity. And then we evaluate in the animal models that actually that's if we take the disease and we build the disease in the animal that this molecule can inhibit the disease and so on. And when we do all of this associated, then we can commit to the phase one and phase two and phase three. So the whole process, it's, it's long and always every day there is new regulations. So for example, now give you an example. If today we discover the aspirin, it may take us 50 years or 20 years to get it approved, or it may not be approved because there is a lot of regulations. Luckily, the aspirin was developed before this regulation has, 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 was there, and uh, we are using it. So many other drugs. So the process here is long and is tedious, but we have no other ways because we always need to find a new drug and new medicine for the human. Like for example, the COVID-19, if we didn't have the process, are we going uh, to stop this disease? No, so it's, it's a must. So this process is a must. This drug discovery is a must. Now to develop now from the target to the uh, phase two, phase three, to develop one drug is over $2.5 billion. Imagine for that one, one molecules. So uh, that is why drug discovery is costly, but we have to do it and we, we need to do it. Now, and this is what, what we call the process, you know, when you are doing drug discovery. In the big pharmaceutical company, they have this process very well optimized. Well, you, you know, you, 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 have the, uh, you have the hit and then you go and you, uh, you, uh, you uh, increase the efficacy, you do a safety, uh, you test the safety and that, you know, 
in along, for example, when you start with molecules, you have to build a thousand and thousand of molecules to find the right molecules that actually give you the uh, the right efficacy and less toxicity. In addition to this, there are all also people who are involved in building on, for example, many of these molecules that we discover, they are insoluble. So what that means is that you always alongside developing and discovering these new molecules, you have to build uh, the, uh, uh, the, the strategy on how, and the, also the know-how and the technology on how to make these molecules soluble. So people can take it as a pill or can inject it. So all of this is drug discovery. And in addition, so uh, the people involved in this, they are people who, who knows very well the biology, who knows the skills, who are always up to, uh, at, at the front, uh, uh, like uh, 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 in the front of the science. So when you are in the big pharma and you work in the big pharma, which is very good, you know, if you could, uh, be in the big pharma. I have I have seen it, and really I, I I was lucky being at GSK and also part of Insight, which is Pfizer. What you know I have they trained me, and I thank them a lot, and it's really appreciate. So if you this if you, the science in the big pharma is more advanced than the academia by twenty to fifteen years. Why? Because they know, for example, the science of today, they need to deliver drug in 20, in 10, 15 years, and they need to be a very high competitive. So it means that they have to think ahead. They need to be very quick. So, uh, and the process, the science. Uh, so this is which called drug discovery, where uh, in the academia, many people shy away from drug discovery because of this. But... That is which called the innovation that is making it more possible. Now, uh, as I said, there are five big challenges in the drug discovery. Uh, the, the challenges is understanding the human diseases in health. Uh, you know, understanding the human health and disease. So as you are a biologist, now I stopped, for example, myself after I get gray, you know, and uh, uh, being in this, looking at these diseases, sometimes I don't look, I don't call these diseases cancer or diseases inflammations. I just call it human disease because what is happening is the same, the same pathway that is activated in cancer is the same pathway that is activated in, uh, in, in inflammations. So, well, for example, we give the same drug for cancer, it will kill the cells, and we give the same drug to uh, immune cells, we inhibit the inflammations. So, uh, and this is, for example, most of the kinase inhibitors. So it means that understanding the disease by itself, it's, uh, it's, uh, you need to be, uh, you need to be uh, innovative on, on, on the way how you understand the disease so you can tackle it from a different uh, way. For example, for example, when you look at the cancer, most of the time people are actually just targeting the, the cells itself, the cancer cells itself. But the cancer, uh, the cancer cell itself, it will not survive in the body if it is not surrounded by an environment that make that cells grow and flourish. So it means that the stroma where the cells is growing, the cancer cells is growing, is as important as the cancer cells to tackle. So, and actually there are certain drugs that actually they don't tackle the cancer cells, but they tackle the stroma cells, the stroma that where the cancer are. So when you tackle the stroma, for example, you limit the cells, the cancer cell to depend on the lipid that are in the surrounding, and also to take the nutrient in the surrounding, then you kill the cells, the same as the inflammatory cells, and so on. So understanding the disease is very important. The, and, the, and the second challenge is identifying the target, and I spoke about that. Then you go, when you have done that, and you are confident, then you go and, uh, you, you go and start screening for the molecules. 
and get the best molecules. That is another challenge because you will find the thousands of molecules. Most of them, they are very high potent, but they are very toxic. If you give them to the cells or you give them to the animal or to the human, you will kill the human before you call the disease. So that is where you have to be very careful on how to develop the right screening. And also, you know, uh, as I said, uh, screening and development. So these are the, the challenges in addition to the cost and the time. Now, because of the, uh, of the uh, you know, the life is speedy and the costly, it's, it's how you get. So these are the, the challenges in drug discovery. Now, when we look in the last 100 years, we look, uh, sorry, when we look at the last 100 years, we try to, uh, we try to overcome these challenges. For example, when we have developed, which called predictive in silico, in vitro. So we do, there are models and there are software and there are uh, tools that actually bioinformaticians and also the IT people with the chemists, where they actually they have developed software where we can do, which called a modeling and we can do in silico screening. So it will help us. Then also actually develop uh, much, uh, we developed a lot of data to give us an, an indications of for the disease that has been studied and also for the target that's being chased. And also we have, we have developed uh, a lot of computer tools that actually can help us in analyzing the data. But with all of that, the number of, for example, for example, when you go and you look at how many how many drugs that actually have been passed the preclinical and passed the phase one, so they are safe, but they fail in the phase two where the, we have to test the efficacy. So we have done all the work until the phase two, but unfortunately the drug failed when we give it to the disease in the human. Even it has worked very well in the animal models. So it means that all our understanding it was not right. So that is why uh, it's, it's really, and, but all of this, it has been uh, uh, studied and it has been developed in the last hundred years. Now, there is a new hope. Doesn't mean that it will, it will uh, uh, like answer all the questions, but it is another innovation that is coming into the drug discovery where I will encourage the new, and the young people who have uh, like passion about drug discovery to actually look at the artificial intelligence. And what mean artificial intelligence, and I'm going to explain it, is that we use the machine to help us understand the data that we have and select what target we have, and also think with us, what are the molecules to make and what they are the molecules not to make. So, you know, in the, I am not an IT person, but the people who are in the IT, it's about deep neural network and the recurrent uh, neural network. So these are in the terminology that is used, used by the computer science that actually they can generate uh, a like software that actually think like neurons. And this is what the artificial intelligence and the artificial intelligence is used everywhere, including the drug discovery. Now, and this is what you know, artificial intelligence means in drug discovery and development is a new era of hope. You know, you can see the neurons and we can model how the neuron functions in the human by uh, mathem mathem mathematical equations. So what is this artificial intelligence can help us is, actually it can accelerate the process, the analysis and learning from the huge. So what happened is that when we go to the big pharma or we go to literatures, we have a huge amount of knowledge. Our brain as a human cannot analyze it all at once. It's impossible. That is why, for example, we as a scientist, naive scientist, we go and focus in a very narrow and very specific topic because we have to be specific because we don't have the capacity as uh, you know, uh, like brain capacity if we go to just PubMed and analyze all the data. We don't have that capacity. So it means there is a lot of knowledge in the, in, in the science that we can't comprehend. 
So then the artificial intelligence can actually go and analyze this data with our understanding and actually we draw conclusion that will help us. So once, once the AI can do that, it we can also help us thinking and accessing and having a new uh, uh, target, which is thinking out of the box. What mean thinking out of the box as you are, you know, you are much understanding this to go and do something innovative and discovery. You need <clears throat> sometimes to think out of the box. So, for example, if uh, it will tell you, for example, estrogen, estrogen, let's say estrogen, it's anti-inflammatory and it works through estrogen receptors. You have to think about maybe estrogen receptors will work differently than just the uh, estrogen may work not just through the estrogen receptors, but it could work through another receptors that is unknown. So think about out of the box. I'm not saying this is the fact, but you need always to question it. But the AI actually can help us in thinking out of the box after analyzing all what has been published. Because sometimes somebody is from Harvard is publishing on this target, on these things. Somebody from the university from Vietnam or from Algeria or from, uh, or from Saudi Arabia or from you know, China is from the same target. There are thousands of other papers that actually is showing the, the activity of this target or these molecules in a different model, but we can't analyze them all. So the artificial antigens can analyze them and can guide us. So this is another help. Also, it can help us in accelerating the clinical trials. So uh, the clinical trials, sometimes we have to uh, uh, like uh, uh, str uh, stratify the patient. And we say to them, actually these molecules, it will not work for this particular patient for certain reason. Not because we have a, we have a genome data and uh, for the genome data, for example, these populations, uh, these populations has a sequence of this target by AAC, for example. A sequence, but these molecules it has been developed in Europe or in America or in China, where actually the population for that particular target it has uh, uh, you know AAT or AAG, so there is uh, like sequence difference, little bit. So it could be the efficacy, and this is called pharmaco uh, pharmacogenomics. So it could be, for example, the molecules is very sensitive, it's very high, it work at very low, uh, very low concentrations at the uh, at the genes that are sequence AAG, AAT, but it has less efficacy for the sequence AAC because you know translations and there is there is uh, so isoforms. But this information it is there, but for us as a scientist, it's very difficult to. Uh, to analyze it at once. So the AI, because of the software, the engineering, the, 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 the capacity can analyze for us this, and it can tell us, I advise you, for example, when you take the clinical trials, don't do it in this population because you will fail, or you do, it's better for you to do it in this population. Well, the AI may be wrong, but it can guide us. And also it can help us in identifying the, uh, the biomarkers, because for us, for in drug discovery, in addition, that actually we develop drug, we have to develop biomarkers to follow the efficacy after phase three. We have to, after like five, 10, 15 years, we have to follow the efficacy of the, our drug. And sometimes the drug is withdrawn. And we have a lot of, uh, a lot of example that drug has been withdrawn from the market after being there for 10, 15 years, because there is an association of uh, a toxicity in the human. And we have to develop very early on a biomarkers. So to avoid this kind of withdrawal after 15, 10 years, because it will be very costly, both because we, we lose a patient and also the costly for the uh, big pharma because they will really pay a lot of money because uh, the, uh, the death is caused by this, uh, by this drug. So the AI can help us in this. So when we put the AI into the equation of the artificial intelligence, 
So we can do it actually all virtually. And we can, before we commit and do physical and chemical property of the molecules, we can look at actually, after we have sent, uh, selected these molecules, we can look virtually and intelligently on uh, the uh, membrane transportations, target binding, cellular responses, animal efficacy. So we, we have to look at all this model by the artificial intelligence before we go and select our molecules. So these are the platforms that actually the artificial intelligence is looking at. And this is, can help us. Now, if we look at the history of when and how and what the artificial intelligence has been developed. So the birth of the artificial intelligence is, has been happening is when the computer and the programming uh, started. And then in the, in the early 50s, right? In the 60s, which called uh, uh, structural function uh, Q, QSR, which is, you know, structural functions, where the people starting to build uh, a, a model and modeling of the molecules we bind with the target. And then in the 70s and the 80s, the docking. We call it computer-added drug discovery docking. So we take the molecules and we do the docking in vitro, because we started to have the crystal structures of the, of, of the proteins. And then in the 90s, the artificial neural networks, the IT people have, have started to uh, tell us how the neuron, and they start mimicking in their programming how the neuron is working. And then it goes on. But when it goes on, actually, the, the another uh, challenge is, is, that, uh, is, is the capacity of the computers. The capacity of the computer when you start uh, building this program, you know, from uh, from eight byte CPU into now gigabyte into multi uh, gigabyte cloud computing. So it means while you are developing this and you are analyzing the data, you have always a parallel. You have to develop the capacity of the computer itself. But now actually we have what's called the cloud computing. So everything is done in the cloud. So these are giving you an idea what's going on. Now, what will be next, we don't know. It's up to you, smart people, young people, talented people, to tell us what next. Because maybe, you know, in, in 10 years, 15 years, all of this is nothing. What is going to be developed in 10, 15 years? And this is where the futures. So if I, for example, I am starting my career in the biological, in the bio, you know, in the, as, as, as a biomedical, uh, biomedical science, this is the area where I, I need to put myself because I know it will not, there is a big chance that I will discover something and there is a big chance that this will bring something to the clinic. So I would put myself here if I am start still, for example, doing my PhD or maybe, you know, a postdoc. These are the area where I need to invest and actually have it in my portfolio of learning. Now, uh, uh, and this is how it happens. So for example, a deep learning in, uh, uh, in choosing the uh, structure. So we take a different structure that we can think of, the database. We put them in input, and there is a lot of hidden, hidden layers of uh, uh, multiple neural uh, uh, network and also uh, uh, programming that actually work together. And then it will give us uh, a probability for the affinity and telling us that actually these structures is will have more affinity for your molecules and this structure does not have molecules. So these are how we are doing the deep learning in the selecting the structures. Also, actually, it can take the data set and there is a lot of data set that is found in, uh, for example, you know, for the people who are working drug discovery, we have the key MDL, we have public uh, domain, uh, which is, you know, for the structures and we get all of this a huge data, really huge data, and we analyze them all, and we do a virtual screening, and we do de novo library. So actually, the artificial intelligence, it takes all of this and give us not just the hit, but give us actually can build a new library. That's, uh, and actually, it can give us uh, like um, uh, what, what happened, it can give us the efficacy 
and give us like virtual how these molecules will inhibit the curves and the uh, the uh, like uh, EC, EC50 and so on. So these are the neural network. Now uh, also uh, uh, it can help us for a repurposing, and this is very important. What do you mean repurposing? Repurposing is you take the drug that is already marketed uh, or maybe failed in phase two, phase three, and actually you take them and you, you take it and you, you with, through the programming, you look at the genome data, as I said to you, for example, when you have a population where uh, diversity pharmaco, pharmaco, uh, pharmaco genomics a a transcriptome proteomic drugs and you put the input layers that you put them and then you do uh, the analysis and the questions through for example the disease information you question now we have this drug that is marketed for example for x disease but can this drug for example can be repurposed for another drug for another diseases it's a good questions now, you can do it in a very simple way. This, for example, came to your mind. You take disease model for both of them. You test it and you see, for example, this would work. But how many can you do this? It's a lot. So because of the data, you know, for example, when you go to uh, big institutions like ours or another one, we have, we have genome sequencing for most of the disease that we have. And we have proteomics. And we have drug. So through artificial intelligence, we can take this information. We take what is known uh, from the uh, literatures about different drugs that's been marketed. And actually, we use the neural networks. And we ask, can we repurpose the drug into this? And believe me, uh, you will be surprised. And you will find a very good hit. At one, and then you have to test them. And I will show you later example that people are doing that. So for example, how the artificial intelligence has helped us in the COVID-19. In the COVID-19 is because of the worldwide trouble. So what happened is that we have to move very quick and there are certain drugs that actually have uh, come up uh, to, as anti antiviral uh, through artificial intelligence. For example, you know, uh, Redemisvir, for example, it has been developed very quickly. And also the uh, paracetinib as very quickly. So this, if you go and look at what has been done, uh, the artificial COVID-19, I think it has played a very big role on accelerating. Uh, you know, for, for example, you know, in the, in the COVID-19, within two years, we had the drug and we had the vaccines. How that? because of this has played a big role. People have moved very quick because of this uh, neural networks. I can give you example, and I will give you in a more deeper analysis, that there are companies that actually they made it to, and made it very quick, very efficiently, where they have developed drugs um, uh, um, uh, for uh, using artificial intelligence, and now they are in clinical phase two. Uh, for example, uh, Simutuko, um, you know, they have developed for serotonin-5 uh, for the obsessive co uh, compulsive disorders. For example, we have uh, inhibitor for in silicon, and they will show you more about the DR1 kinases. So there are companies that actually they have done this very recently in the last four or five years. Four or five years, you build the whole, you, you build the whole portfolio uh, both as computer analysis and actually you go and do the analysis and you go to and reach the phase two very quickly. That's really uh, very transformable. Now I will I will share with you uh, I, I will share with you a few slides. I just received them this morning uh, uh, from my friend Alex, uh, who is the CEO of the Insilico which is one of the pioneering company uh, in silico. So I will show you what they are doing. And inshallah, you will be among them uh, to do something like this. And I am showing this for Algeria because we have smart people that they can do computing. 
And you know, when you do in silico, you can build programs uh, quickly. You don't need uh, too many labs. And when you have built that, you can sell your idea outside. And they can share with you uh, this morning, you know, Alex, uh, the CEO of this in silico, I asked his permission and he sent me, uh, he sent me his, uh, one second, I'm, yeah. Send me this uh, slide to uh, share, uh, share them with you. Just one second. Uh, so, so in silico, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, a company that's been born uh, very recently, I think in the last five, six years, and now it has phase two, and it has actually collaborations and partnership with all, I would say maybe, maybe with all the big pharma company and everybody is look at them as a real model. So this is what can the artificial do. So in silico, and to give you a real example, is to accelerate, what is the mission? Is to accelerate drug discovery and development by leveraging our rapidity evolving property pharma, artificial antigen platforms across biology, plus chemistry, and close clinical development. They are existing in, uh, in China, they are existing in Hong Kong, they are existing in Abu Dhabi, they are existing in Canada, and they are existing in the US. And they have developed platform that I'm going to show them to you. Biology 42, which is uh, a platform for the artificial antigen for biology, chemistry 42, and medicine communities. And they have pipelines. Well, they are developing this actually, and they can license the, this, this program to any company. By themselves, they do their own drug discovery. So forth, they have 31 programs and they have 29 drug targets. They are over 300 employee and they have all, over 250 research and developed professionals. So what do they have as artificial intelligence? So they have developed this platform called Biology 42. So Biology 42, they have the Panda Omics. This Panda Omics is artificial, artificial intelligence platforms that actually you can take any omics data, genomic, proteomics, metabolisms, you call it, and you, you go into these programs, artificial energy, ask questions. You tell them, for example, I want, these are the disease, this is omic from the disease, disease X. I want you to analyze the data and give me what is going wrong in this disease and what is the potential target that I could uh, uh, use it to actually uh, uh, like uh, treat this disease. And then it will generate for you pathways that actually these pathways that are uh, either inhibited or activated in this disease. And then it gives you a lifestyle. Lifestyle, it's a robotic uh, machines that actually can do the screening for you. While you are doing that, while it does that, it will actually, you can take that information and you go to the chemistry 42, you say, okay, I have found these targets. I have found this biology pathways. Can you suggest for me what kind of molecules that I can use to actually inhibit or activate? It will give you through artificial intelligence and analyzing all the data existing. It can suggest for you molecules that you can synthesize and you can test. And then uh, it will give you even the uh, uh, absorption, you know, absorption, metabolism, extractions, uh, predictions. And it will give you the eye chemistry. It will give you even in how you can synthesize these molecules. Then once you have done that, you can go to the next one, which is uh, a clinical. Actually, it can predict for you what this, if you take this molecule to the clinic, what will happen. Now, you can... Maybe stop here and say, okay, I will synthesize, I will do this, and we'll do that. Generate your own data. Once you generate the data, you feed it into the clinical, to the artificial intelligence uh, clinical trial platform, where actually it can tell you where it is worth to take this molecule to the clinic or not. And it can give you what kind of populations that you need to have. So this is called a co-pilot. The whole process now is called the co-pilot. You can go to Insilico and say, look, I would like to license your co-pilot. 
I'm doing drug discovery and they would like to license copilot. Now this copilot is now being licensed by many big pharma. Now you as you a smart intelligent persons, uh, a good uh, coming, think in this way, think about uh, this way, that's actually you can build programs and you can think uh, in the way. There is no limit, especially now, you know, everybody is, is busy with the online. So you can get the information and you can think in this way. So, uh, and these are uh, Alex, uh, who is the CEO and, you know, the uh, people who are leading with him, Fan and also Michaels and Alan, and they have big. So for example, they have used the Panda uh, Omics and they had discovered the CDK20 as a good class. They take that and they have generated molecules that actually can inhibit. This is all to do with, you know, uh, which called uh, in silico, not in silico and artificial intelligence. And they have developed small molecules inhibitors and they have taken it in vivo and they have showed that actually this exactly works. So for example, from here in two round, in two round, they moved from 7.3 uh, micromolars efficacy into 180 nanomolars in two round you know, uh, compound generations in chemistry 42. This is very quick, it's remarkable. Now, uh, and here they give you an example as well. You know, uh, for example, traditional approach, as you can go, you know, traditional approach here, you can take one year, it take you uh, uh, 94 millions uh, to do the, uh, the Yenwar, you know, to do the predictions or maybe do the target validations and so forth. Sorry, I'm, uh, and you go and take, you know, how much? But in, 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 in Silicon, what they have within 30 months, they have moved from target discovery to initiating phase one. Imagine that. That's remarkable. And they have other programs, as you can see, you know, within eight months, 18 months, for example, they have uh, uh, repurpose or repurposing or discovering one of the kinases that actually uh, it was, uh, I think it was used is as uh, anti fibrotic uh, target, but they are repurposing for another uh, 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 another disease and so on. So you can see how many now months uh, it takes. It takes shorter and they are very efficacy, efficacious. So uh, I will skip this, just repeat, but this just give you, for example, uh, announce the positive top line result of uh, of the New Zealand phase one tri clinical trials and now, use entering uh, phase two. And these are the steps they are be taking to go from, uh, as I said, uh, 30 months from uh, from nothing into phase two. Uh, and they have done all that in vitro. You know, they do, then they do, so what they do is that they do uh, prediction, they do uh, artificial in, in, in silico. Once they finish with the phase, they take what they found and test it in the lab and actually in 90% they found what they have found, what they have predicted it would work in, uh, in, uh, in the lab and vice versa until they, they reach the phase one, uh, phase two. So these are, uh, these are, uh, uh, yes, I'm done. Actually, I'm done. So I will not, uh, I will not. So these are just an overview, uh, what they have as what artificial uh, antigen has done for them. And they are role models for anybody that want to work uh, in this uh, uh, in this area. And I, I will be, I will stop here uh, uh, because I think uh, I, I love my last slide. Uh, this is actually what they have done. In addition to the artificial, they have built a virtual lab, automated lab, where and now that lab they have launched it, and actually everything is robotic. You don't need to go by yourself. Everything is getting robotic from the computer. Uh, so uh, I think uh, the, uh, my last slide, and sorry if I kept uh, long, uh, let me uh, uh, just one second. Uh, my last slide is this one. Uh, so my last slide I will finish here is understanding the structure of the function of the genome. This is where you still need to understand and the proteome. 
underpinning the uh, the uh, underpinning the orchestra of transcription translations because that is where a lot of thinking is being done to identify helping the rare diseases this is another area where the artificial intelligence can help us predicting emerging and actually is how do you predict re-emerging of new and old diseases this is also where the artificial intelligence can play uh, play a role and medicinal pathways. So I would stop here and inshallah, maybe in the next time I will present for you the mRNA technology, but I will stop here and happy to answer any of your questions. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much, Dr. Bujillel. That was actually very a very comprehensive talk. Uh, I, I think you gave, as you said, a very broad, but you gave all the essential notions regarding the, especially how to the drug design, of course, and the drug discovery, but uh, you gave a, uh, like a very uh, great number of information regarding the machine learning that is actually behind uh, the, the discovery and the design and the development of a new drug. So thank you very much. I think everyone was actually quite understanding what, uh, well, what you have said. So we have some questions. Some of them have been already um, answered during your talk. So I will go directly to those that are actually uh, most, let's say, uh, most important. So one of them is how much uh, is uh, the animal experimentation important in the drug discovery or the drug uh, process, if we can say, and uh, are, are we now going to use less animal and more machine learning? Yeah, it's, it's a very good question. So I think that's question been asked many, many times. And the good thing is that now, even with the regulations with the US FDA, they have, uh, they have given the permission that actually um, uh, uh, testing less animal models uh, and less testing less uh, in the animals to give uh, the approval to go phase two, uh, phase one. Uh, but at, at the moment, even if we do in silico, and we do the predictions, we still have to test uh, in the animal, unfortunately, because we have no other models. There are other models that have been developed like 3D and, you know, um, uh, 3D models in the, but they are still not yet at the optimum. Uh, but as I said, the good news is that last year, the USFDA, they have limited uh, the number that uh, uh, to uh, go and get the approval phase one, which is good. Uh, but unfortunately, we still need to do the, uh, even if you have done in silico, you still have to do some uh, some work in the animal models. Okay, great. The next question is between the five biggest challenge that you showed in, in, the, in a previous slide about the drug discovery, which one is actually the most difficult? Um, it's, I think it's all of them, it's at the same level. Uh, it's at the same level. Uh, there is nothing called difficult and nothing is called easy. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's challenge. I think predicting the emerging and new old diseases, it's quite interesting. Uh, if the artificial intelligence can actually uh, work on that, so we will avoid what COVID-19 has done and maybe worse than that because there is re-emergence of the new diseases. I think, uh, uh, to be frank, helping the rare disease and the orphan diseases is, is very important. The reason is uh, because of the cost of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of making a new drug, uh, peop I mean, people uh, avoid uh, to go to uh, rare diseases because the cost and the rare diseases is only for like limited populations and uh, num a number of patients, but they suffer. So if we can actually, with artificial intelligence, we can help to accelerate and uh, help the rare diseases, that's really quite good, uh, quite good. Okay, great. Another question. Um, so we 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 talked, you, you, you sorry, you talked a little bit about the... Uh, codom optimization during uh, uh, the drug development. Can you give us some a little bit more information about that? Uh, yes. Uh, so what mean we call we call pharmacogenomics. Uh, uh, pharmacogenomics is very a new. It's um, 
it's uh, it's uh, it's essential um, uh, it's es essential uh, know-how in drug discovery because most for example if you take a sequence a genome sequence there is divergence between one population to another population. For example, the Arabs, or maybe you know the uh, the Asians, or maybe the Europeans. Although the sequence, uh, the the uh, uh, the genome is 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 the kind of the same, but there is a variability. For example, you take a sequence of kinase that we are targeting. Let's say sequence of kinase that we are targeting uh, to kill. Uh, uh, to kill uh, cancer. So the sequence of this kinase uh, in European is the same, but it's a little bit different than the sequence in Asian population, but it's a little bit different than the Arab populations. So this little bit difference, especially when it came to the coding sequence, for example, there is a coding sequence, for example, there is AA, uh, for example, alanine, alanine, um, uh, whatever, methionine, for example. And you will find it, for example, uh, differently than the European. So the, because, because we are doing this optimization, most of the big pharma, they are European or from the North America or from the Asians. They do optimizations of their molecules based on the sequence that they have it in the in their populations, so and the efficacy is high. But when it comes to our populations, we have to optimize the dose because our sequence is different. So we have to optimize the dose. So this is where we have to be very careful, and this is very important. For example, in our population, to know our sequence, our genome sequence. So tomorrow, tomorrow, if we have a drug, a new drug that's coming to our market. We can do the analysis to see if this actually is uh, will be as efficacy as the uh, uh, in the population that has been developed. So the genome sequence and is very important uh, for our uh, medicine as well. So hopefully I answered your question. Yeah, yeah, you answered that question, and that's why I think right now, <clears throat> right now they are uh, running a. Um like a kind of Algerian genome sequencing or something like that to know effectively where are our all polymorphism in all genes that yeah. can actually be uh, better used in our population regarding the drugs. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. That was yeah. the... So another question is that, uh, do you have an idea in which way is machine learning applied to optimize the dosage? And the release mechanism in drug delivery systems like vaccines or something. yeah it's very good questions and uh, this is where uh, for example uh, i wanted actually maybe presented next time in the mrna vaccines and also in the uh, therapy so uh, the artificial energy is not just in the prediction it's also in the formulations especially when it came to a biological uh, and also release. So uh, it will help us actually to uh, optimize the formulations of the drug uh, in what condition, especially now we are using uh, most of the nanoparticles to deliver drug. And nanoparticles are a new understanding. Uh, so uh, having uh, artificial intelligence, having the, uh, the, the know-how, it helps us actually to formulate the best ingredients to give uh, a solubility and also to increase the absorptions of the molecules in our gut. So yeah, I, I think that's that's uh, by itself is not and uh, definitely artificial intelligence is playing a big role on that. Okay, I think we have our last question and then we can wrap up our Zoom. So. Can you please share insights uh, into the method or technologies that you find most promising for target identification in today's uh, landscape? Like the most promising? Yes, good. Uh, I think the, the most important, be good scientists and be vigilant. And when you read informations, read it with criticism. Mm -hmm. And uh, and when you uh, so now there is a new so the, a new understanding to think about the targeting disease is very important. 
Now to uh, uh, target, there is the new technology, which is CRISPR. They are now using it very well, for example, to eliminate. We, we used to do it with knockdown before to eliminate the, uh, the target in cells and questions. But there is new technology with CRISPR. It's novel technology to eliminate. Also, actually, you can do overexpressions, or maybe you can express the mutated proteins, or maybe you can look also uh, the expression level of this target in a different disease state. So you would now actually, when this, when this target is not there, the disease is not there. So it's, 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 uh, it's a combination of technique. There is not one technique because when you evaluate the target, you have to question, to ask many questions and you have to answer them. And what we, we have, what we call it in the big pharma, we call it the killing questions. So there is two types of question in science. There is question that you just ask to elongate your research and say, I will do this, right? But you are not really asking the question whether it will give you the right answer, yes or no. In the target validations and when you are doing drug discovery and when you are working on this because you want to do the killer questions, yes or no, it means not that. If I eliminate this protein in these cells, is this cells going to be normal or not? If these cells, for example, when you, I eliminate this protein in these cells, but the cells is not, is still, is still not, is still, still like functioning as disease. So it means that my target is not right. So you have to ask the killer questions. And when you pass the killer questions, then you, you, you go to the next step, which is, yes, I think it's still there. It's still valid. You still have to ask another killer question until you make sure that your target is the good. Because once you commit to the target, after it, it's a long time and also it's costly. Hopefully I answer your questions. That was very clear, Dr. Bujalal. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So yeah, I think it's uh, twelve. It's uh, six or seven. We we are we are okay with the time that we. I think we started five minutes after normal time. So thank you very much again, Dr. Bujalal. Thank, thank you for all people that were uh, actually with us today. And uh, yeah, keep in touch every Saturday yeah. with Inshallah to discuss very exciting questions. And yeah. thank, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bujilla. That was great. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Inshallah, we will uh, we will do it. Inshallah, inshallah. Inshallah. Shukran, shukran. Salam alaikum. Never.